Hey everyone, hope y'all are having a great day. We're going to continue into our Genesis study. Um, we're going to look at the last part of Genesis 28, and I think we're going to go just about halfway through chapter 30. So if y'all will get your pens and your paper and your Bible and all that ready, we will get started. Okay, so we're in chapter 28. We have now seen that Jacob and Esau have parted. Basically, mom and dad have realized that if he stays there any longer, he actually his life is in jeopardy. So what they're going to do is they're going to send him away and they're going to send him to the place of Haran. This is Abraham's descendants. And hopefully while he's there, God's going to be favorable and they're going to find a wife for him and everything is going to start moving forward. Kind of keep this in the back of your minds. Until we get a wife for these men, the covenant, we don't ever really see the covenant moving forward with single men. There's something about a covenant between a husband and a wife that also perpetuates the covenant forward for the covenant of God to move forward in time. So now we're up to um, Jacob. He's going to leave Beersheba. He's going to head over to Haran. And he comes to a certain place. And I want us to kind of think about the word place. Because we're going to see here place is important. So he comes to a certain place there. And it would help if y'all had the verses, right? Let's click. There we go. And so he comes to a certain place. And he stays there the night. And um, it, the scripture says because the sun was getting ready to set. So he, he realizes he can't go any further in his journey. The sun is setting. It's not a... Not a great place um, to be around by yourself. So he takes the stones and there's these stones there and he takes them and he's going to basically make a circle. He's going to make a place for him to lay his head down. Then we're going to see he's going to make a circle of it. So kind of start thinking about stones. What could stones represent? That would be a really good word study for y'all to do. And so he's going to Haran, hopefully going to find a wife. But while he's there, he realizes, hey, the sun's setting, but he, he uses these stones as a pillow. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I've never, I've never been a big camper, but making a pillow out of a stone or making a stone into a pillow doesn't really seem to be comfortable, right? <laughs> doesn't seem to be logical. So there's something else about these stones that we're going to see in the next little piece, but we know that... Um, that this place of Haran is going to be important. We're going to also see some characters come back into the picture. And so start also thinking about full circle. God always brings us full circle with prophecy. Prophecy may repeat itself, but it also comes full circle. And so we know that we're going to see um, the continuation of the covenant, but there's this place that he is at. Remember when we first started our study in Genesis, I said that location is going to be very important. We're going to go over this same land over and over and over again. So he comes to this place and this place is going to be critical because in verse 11 alone, we see it mentioned a number of times. We see he came to a certain place. He stayed there at that place the stones of that place. He lays down in that place. And so there's this connotation of, of being in this place, this location is critical to something. And so start thinking about when I see the word over and over again, or I say the concept over and over again, what is God trying to show me? And so he dreams. So he's there, he's laying down. So he dreams. And behold, there was a ladder set up on earth, and on the top of it, it reached to the heavens. And behold, angels of God were ascending and descending upon it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord. I am Lord. So God is giving some information. I am, I'm not only the Lord, I am the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. And the land that you are lying on I'm going to give this to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad from west to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all of the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and I will keep you wherever you go. 
and I will bring you back to this land for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. Then he was afraid and he said, how awesome is this place? There is nothing like this place, period, on the face of the planet. This is none other than the house of God and this is the gate of heaven. So early in the morning, Jacob took the stone, remember the stone that was under his head, he takes it and he sets it up as a pillar and he anoints the oil. Remember the place. He realizes he's not scared in the afraid sense of, hey, I'm, I'm at her by myself afraid. He is a, in awe of the reverence and the fear of the Lord at this point. He realizes he has had an encounter with the one and only God, the God Elohim, the creator. And he realizes this place is going to be important. But when he sees these, um, this ladder and this angel, um, these angels come up and down on it, I want you to think more of an arc, like a bridge instead of a ladder leaning up against the house. Because I believe this is very much like the imagery that we see with Abraham receiving his part of the covenant that he um, walks the length, the breadth, and the width of the land. So he sees all of the land all at one time in the spirit. And I think the same thing is happening to Jacob here. Not only does he see these angels ascending and descending, but he sees the breadth and the width of the land in the spiritual. And so when he realizes what he ha has encountered, he realizes this is holy ground. And this is something that I'm going to have to make a remembrance. So he puts a, an altar of sorts up. He calls the place Bethel. Um, this city is actually also named Luz. But right now we're going to lean into why would Jacob call this particular place Bethel? This literally means the house of God. Put a pin there because that's going to be important. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in the way that I will go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I may come to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone, which I have set up as a pillar or an altar, this shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give a full tenth to you. So God is making um, an additional statement to Jacob personally about the covenant. God always reveals his covenant to our patriarchs in person. So when we see he's, he's mentioning this, he's mentioning the covenant is going to continue. Some things are going to happen that are going to help perpetrate that covenant, but you're going to be the next in line. But where you're at is going to be a unique place. This unique place is going to be the future spot of where the temple would be. This land, this geography is absolutely critical to the peace of the covenant. The covenant is not only with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and we're going to see later the people of Israel, but the land is part of the covenant. So the land is connected to the people. The people are connected to the land. The land is connected to the animals, and the people are connected to the animals. All of this stems from the promise that Noah got that he would have a covenant with the people and the land, and he would no longer destroy the earth by flood or by water. Here, we're moving a little forward. We're getting more information in that Jacob's going to be this next person that's going to rise up, and he's going to be the next piece in this covenant. So God has given him the same language, but now he's giving him something a little bit different. He says, this place shall be the house of God. This is now the sixth time the place, the word place has been mentioned. So this place has got to mean something, but because he sees it as not just a ladder going to heaven and the angels coming up and down, he sees it exactly out as God wants him to. It is the house of God. It is where God is going to dwell physically as part of the temple that is going to be created, you know, later down the road. Jacob makes a promise or a vow to the Lord. If God is with him, he will um, provide for him he will be faithful to him um, and he this is where we get some information about the prophetic language here um, this passage is prophetic it speaks to God's people coming into the land and going out into exile only to come back into the land so here we're setting up the land is yours the people are going to inhabit the land 
that I'm never going to leave you. Jacob never really returns back to his father's house. He never really comes back to his father's house in peace. But this, this is a very prophetic piece of scripture. So if you are a highlighter in your Bible, you may want to highlight some of these passages because we're going to come back to this passage in the future. But this is where God has made a promise of this land is going to be part of that covenant. I've already made that statement, but I'm, I'm reminding you of it. I haven't forgotten, but I'm reminding you that the covenant is for the land and with the people. All right, so the last part of Genesis um, 28 is directly connected to this because now we're moving in to some additional information about how is this covenant going to look? Who is going to be the wife? He's going to be the one that's going to tend the sheep, show, so to speak, um, that we're going to see moving into a people. Remember, we're, we're talking about family, but we're talking about moving into a holy people. So through the family of Jacob, we're going to see a continuation of people coming out. And we're going to see a lot of people coming out with Jacob because he has a bunch of chick, a bunch of children. So um, when we see this language, we want to start keeping track of people at this point, because the people that we see here are going to end up being the children of Israel, and they are going to be the ones we're going to focus on when we get to Exodus. Okay, so let's look at the chapter, the first few verses of chapter 29. Then Jacob went on his journey and he came to the land of the people of the east. As he looked, he saw a well in the field and behold, three flocks of sheep lying beside it. For out of that well, the flocks were watered. The stone on the well's mouth was large. And when all the flocks were gathered there, the shepherds would roll the stone back from the, would roll the stone from the mouth of the well and, the, and water the sheep and put the stone back in its place over the mouth of the well. So this is very interesting language. This is directly connected. So after Jacob has his encounter with God, he gathers up his items and he goes on his journey. And so he, um, he basically is, is traveling across the land and he sees the people of the east. So he, he's dwelling, he's walking through the land of the east and he sees these wells. The Hebrew here um, reads that Jacob lifted up his feet. So if you look at the word feet, it's very interesting in that it reminds us of Isaiah 52, 7, that feet can represent the gospel message. It can represent salvation. How beautiful are the feet, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings the good news, who publishes peace, who brings good, who brings the good news of happiness and publishes salvation. Who says to Zion, your God reigns. Nahum 115 says the same thing. Behold the mountains, upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings the good news, who publishes peace. They keep your feast, O Judah. Fulfill your vows, for never again shall the worthless pass through. He is utterly cut off. So Jacob is heading um, and he's going to encounter the people of the east. These are the enemies of God and of Israel. And he sees this, this well of water. And this is very significant because where did Eleazar find the wife for Isaac? At a well of water. Where's Moses going to find Zipporah? At a well of water. Where, where's Jacob going to find his wife? At a well of water. Where does God reveal himself through Jesus to the woman of Samaria? What is she doing? She's at a well of water. So start connecting women wells and water and that could be a sign of redemption so Eleazar finds a wife uh, for Isaac and now it's time for Jacob to also find his wife and so we see constantly this image of the the well in the water foreshadows part of the marriage in that marriage covenant in the New Testament we see this same language about water living water is a sign of redemption and salvation but it's interesting that we see that there's three sheep, there's three flocks of sheep. And y'all can do a deep dive on this, but it's an interesting study about what these flocks could represent. In Hebrew, when you're looking at the well that the waters were, the, from the well, the water, the flocks were watered, the Hebrew here indicates 
that they received the water from that one well. This was the well that they all received the water from. So there's only the one well, but there's a great stone over the well. There is, there's this huge well with a stone on it. And until everyone gets there, there is no watering of the flocks. Everyone has to be there. And then they take the lid off, so to speak. So there's a couple of different theories. Some people say it's because there was a scarcity of water and no one could be trusted. You know, <laughs> I want my flocks to get watered first and I'm not really concerned about your flocks. It could be that it takes more than one shepherd to move the stone away. Imagery here, right? It could take more than one shepherd to move the stone to water the animals. In these two verses, we see the word stone three times. So there's an emphasis here of the word stone. We often see that Messiah is referenced as a stone. He is the cornerstone. He's the stone that was rejected. He was the rock or is the rock of salvation. So we see this imagery here that the stone could represent Jesus. It could represent our Messiah. And without the removal of the stone, without the, the stone being removed, there is no access to the water. So the only way you're going to access this living water is through that stone, through the Messiah. We see this imagery all throughout the New Testament. Without the Messiah, you have no access to the living water that provides salvation. The stone provides the water. Does that sound familiar when we talk about Moses in the wilderness? There's this stone that gives water. It gives the life and, and the, the ability to continue life, even in the driest and in the most wilderness of places. So start putting this in your, in your little book of concepts as stone. All right, so the next few verses we're going to see um, Jacob is going to interact with them. So Jacob says, my brothers, where do you come from? And they said, we are from Haran. And he said to them, do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? They said, we know him. And he said to them, is it well with him? Is it well? And they said, yes, it is well. See Rachel, that girl over there, that real pretty one, that is his daughter coming to water the sheep. She's bringing the sheep here. And he said, behold, it is still high day. It is not time for the livestock to be gathered together to be watered. You know, why are they watering the sheep at this particular time of day? It doesn't make sense. And he says they need to be quickly watered and they go back out to pasture because it's just hot. But they said to him, we cannot water until all the flocks are gathered and the stone is rolled away from the mouth of the well. Then we water the sheep. We have an order here. And you're going to come in, you're going to step out of order. And they're trying to get him to understand there is a particular way that we do things here. We have our particular doctrine. While he was still speaking with him, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. Now, as soon as Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, Jacob came near and he rolled the stone from the well's mouth, watered the flock with a flock belonging to Laban. Then he kissed Jacob, I and mean, then he kissed Le uh, Rachel and wept aloud. And Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's kinsman and that he was Rebecca's son. And she ran and told her father. Lots of things going on. So the first person that he encounters that is a shepherd is a shepherdess, right? It's a woman. So Jacob talks with him and they realize, you know, hey, there's, there's this thing going on, but he is so struck with her that he, decides that he's going to act he's going to take some action right and so he is going to remove the stone from the well and water the sheep so if we kind of look at this through a spiritual lens and we know the water is the source of life we know that the picture of salvation Jacob is the one that unlocks this water this well of salvation all of those other men, we don't know if, if the stone was so large that only one man could do it or, or it required, you know, four or five men. But ne nevertheless, Jacob is the one that realized the sheep are in danger. They needed the water. I'm going to act. And so it's a picture of what is to come with the Messiah. All people are welcomed to drink from the well. It's not to be restricted at any length or any at any time. Everyone can come and drink. 
He greets Rachel with a family kiss. He lifts his voice and he realizes that God has given him divine favor here. It's a beautiful picture. So let's see what happens next. It reads so much like a, like a wonderful story, right? So verses 13 to 20. So as soon as Jacob, or as soon as Laban has heard about the news of Jacob, we kind of have to remember who Laban is, right? Laban is his uncle. Um, remember when we had the narrative of Rebecca and Eleazar goes and he finds Rebecca. Laban's excited, right? Because Isaac is going to bring forth a document. When Eleazar comes, he has this document that proves that he is an inherited man. He's going he's gonna to get stuff. He's going to be very wealthy. Eleazar brings all kinds of goodies with him, all kinds of beautiful things. So he's excited. So he runs and he meets Jacob and he embraced him and he kissed him and brings him into the house. Jacob tells him everything that has happened. And Laban said, surely your bone and your bone of my bone and your flesh of my flesh. And he stays with him for a month. Now that's interesting because we know that Jacob is poor as a church mouse. He has nothing with him. He's been in exile for a number of years. Um, scholars think that he's been studying under the school of Eber, uh, Eber, if you want to call it that, and he's been studying Torah for about 14 years. But now we see him coming, and so he has nothing to offer. And some scholars wonder that's why he embraced him so tightly to kind of pat him down. Hey, do you have any good stuff for me? But he realizes that, you know, he's poor, so he stays with him. But after a month, Laban goes, wait a minute. I know you're my kinsman, but guess what? You got to get a job. I'm not going to let you lay here and you're not going to serve me for nothing. What is your wages? So he's trying to trying to, um, to figure out how much we're going to pay him. So Laban had two daughters. The older was named Leah and the younger was named Rachel. Uh, Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel's were beautiful form and in form and of appearance. Jacob loved Rachel and he said I have I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter Rachel Laban said well, it's better I give her to you than should I give her to any other man stay with me so Jacob served and worked for seven years for Rachel but they seemed but just a few days because of the great love he had for her now this is going to set up a situation we're going to talk about in the next passage but Rachel is excited so she runs and she tells Laban what's going on this is very much like the story of Rebecca, but Rebecca goes to her mom. Notice that Laban is ready to greet. He's pretty excited. So I think his wheels were already starting to turn. Now, we know that God had a hand in all of this, right? We know that God has divinely maneuvered here and that he is setting up the circumstances that are going to be needed for the perpetuity of this covenant. But Laban is not a man to be trusted. Um, we see that much later in scripture, but we already know that because we have the benefit of all scripture. So after he starts serving and he starts um, basically um, working for Laban, Laban is going to agree to give him his daughter, Rachel. But there's a problem here. Leah's eyes were weak and Rachel's were beautiful. So I want us to kind of look at this passage. When we see Rachel's eyes were weak, we don't think that don't think that in terms that she was ugly or anything like that. They just describe them as weaker or being soft. Scholars also say that Rebecca, uh, because she had two sons and Laban had two daughters, it was assumed that they would marry each other. So that means um, Rachel would marry Jacob because they are technically the youngest, but then that would leave poor Leah marrying Esau. Now, I don't know about you, but that would make me want to cry constantly because she knew the kind of man Esau was. He has all these Hittite women and Canaanite women and Ishmaelite women. So he knows or she knows that this is not going to be a good match, right? So it says scripture can, can refer to her eyes being weak as that she was crying constantly because she was in line to marry Esau. Um, God saw her tears, but he made her fruitful of all the women Jacob married and so we can look at the word for weak in Hebrew and that could really mean rock which means royalty we know from her we get the line of David we get the line of priest she would literally be the mother 
to kings and priests. Jacob agrees that, yes, you can have Rachel, but, you know, he's got this other girl he's got to get married off to. So at the end of these seven years, Jacob comes to Laban and said, hey, give me my wife and I may go into her. My time for you has completed. I have done seven years for her. And now it's time basically for me to get what's due to me. So Laban gathers everybody together. It's going to be a big, big feast. And basically when um, she and, and, or he and Laban have made the agreement, they were already under a ketubah, a marriage contract. Jacob could, write, Jacob could rightly call her wife, but until the um, marriage was consummated at the end of that seven year period, they were not legally married, so to speak, but they were already betrothed. So there were things in place that, um, yeah, they were technically married, but not, not outright until that marriage was consummated. So Laban makes this huge feast. It's a huge celebration. Everybody's having fun. And at the end of it all, at the end of the evening, he takes his daughter Leah, brings her to Jacob, and Jacob goes into her. Laban has given his um, female servant to Zilpah to be a servant to Leah. So Laban has arranged for um, her to have a handmaiden of sorts. In the morning, behold, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, what have you done to me? Did I not serve for you to, to give me Rachel? Why have you deceived me? Laban said, it's not done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Um, again, firstborn, secondborn imagery here. Complete the week of this one and I will give you the other one in return for, serv for serving me another seven years. Jacob did so. He completed her bridal week. And then Laban has given his daughter Rachel to be his wife. Laban gave his female servant Bilhah to his daughter Rachel to be her servant. So Jacob, so Jacob goes in to Rachel also. He loved her more than Leah and served another seven years for her. So lots to unpack. So at the end of the evening, basically he, he does a switcheroo. He brings Leah to Jacob and not Rachel. Leah's name was not on the marriage document. Laban gave Zilpah to Leah as a servant and Zilpah was the younger. So Jacob probably assumed that the younger maid is one with the younger daughter. He did the same thing with Bilhah, the older maid with the older sister. Jacob is mad because he, he, is, he has been deceived, right? But here we see the, the word for younger and older is not necessarily the same as in chronological age. It means smaller as in, um, I'm sorry, let me back that up. When we see Jacob um, being introduced to Leah and Rachel, Rachel is the smaller, not the younger. And we see the word um, for older for Leah, it means greater, not younger. So Jacob has been given two wives. He's been given Rachel, the, the smaller, Leah, the greater. But here, when we're talking about the um, concubines or the, um, not the concubines, but the handmaidens, it is literally younger and older. So sorry for that confusion. Because we see Leah and Rachel, not just an older sister and a younger sister, we see one as greater and smaller. We see that prophetically Leah is going to be greater than Rachel in the number of children, but there's also um, prophetic children coming from her as well. Laban tells him, you, you know, this is how we do this here. So you're going to have to basically just suck it up, work another seven years, and boom, you'll have two wives, right? It's interesting because there are scholars that think that Leah and Rachel were in on the deception. If, you, if your sister was going to marry an oaf like Esau, would you really want that? Probably not. So some scholars say that Rachel and Leah were in on the switch. And that's why the switching of the, the handmaidens was important. Um, I don't know if that's true or not. I kind of like, I like that thought a little bit because Rachel at this point was not in competition with her sister. Only with the children come does the competition come. But right now we see that she is, um, she's basically sister, they're equals at this point. 
in their minds, they're thinking that they're going to get married, they're going to have children, and they're going to um, just kind of, you know, hold hands, get along for the rest of their lives. There's going to be some competition coming in the next chapter or the next set of verses. So the last part of this chapter is when we see um, when we see them getting married, we know the next logical step is children. So, so it was important for the children to come because in this culture, if you did not provide children, your husband could divorce you. And so when we see that the Lord saw that Leah was hated, so he opened her womb. Rachel, who was loved, her womb was closed. Had Rachel been the one to have the children and Leah not have the children, Leah could have been put, um, put through a divorce, so to speak, and she could have been put away. So God in his sovereignty, he knows this rule, right? I mean, he is God. And so he realizes that Leah is not as loved. And so he's going to open her womb. And, and having children, it's going to solidify her status, not just as wife, but as mother. And we're going to see that mother's important because um, this is going to bond her to her husband in a way that he is not going to be able to put her away. He's not going to be able to divorce her. He may not love her, but he is not going to be able to leave her um, without an inheritance, without a covering. Um, and he's, he's just going to have to stay with her, whether he truly loves her or not. Um, for the sake of him having children with her, that gives her a different position in the community. So think about that. That's another of uh, those Near East culture things that's important that sometimes we have to say, yeah, that's not quite fair, but this is the system that they worked with. And so Leah conceives and she has one son. The first son is called Reuben. And she says, because the Lord has looked upon my affliction. How was she afflicted? Well, she's afflicted because she has a husband who has made it known that he doesn't love her as much as that first one. He wanted that first one first. <coughs> Excuse me. And now she sees that, okay, because I've had this child, now, now my husband will love me. Now my husband will be a, um, a caring person to me. He's going to love me like a, like a husband. She conceives again and she bears another son. And she says, the Lord has heard that I am hated. So he's given me this son and I'm going to call this son Simeon. And so we start having a birth order. And I want y'all to keep track of the birth order because this is going to be really, really important down the road. When we start talking about them getting blessings and them getting um, at the end of Jacob's life being blessed, we're going to see that the birth order um, is one thing, but the blessing order is something completely different. So she conceives again, and now she says, okay, I've been given a third son. We're going to call him Levi. Now, this time, we'll, my husband will be attached to me because I have given him three sons. So now she's looking to be loved. She's looking to be heard, but then she's looking to be attached. She's wanting her husband to be attached to her. And that doesn't really happen, right? Right? But something interesting happens when she gets the fourth one. We, we, we kind of see a pattern here of, um, in Leah, because she's working hard to be noticed, she's working hard to be loved and to be heard, and she's naming these children based on how she's seeing her situation and herself. She's not seeing how God is moving in this situation, so their names strongly reflect how um, they're going to grow up, because these are actual little prophecies over her children. She's seeing herself as a victim of circumstances. Her husband doesn't love her. So bearing sons should be enough. Her husband doesn't hear her. So bearing sons should be enough. Third one, now my husband should be fully attached to me because I have given three sons, right? Wrong. <laughs> so when we get to the last son on this particular chapter, we see that she conceives again, she bears another son, this is the fourth son, and she says, this time, 
I will praise the Lord. Isn't that beautiful? So we think that she's coming for a full circle. We see that she's going to name his son Judah. And that means praise. Judah's name actually contains the letters of the name of God. It has the hay and the yod in it. So we think that, hey, she's finally coming around. She's going to see that God is moving in this situation. Unfortunately, at this particular time, she stops having children. God just closes her womb up. She's got four children and she's going to have others. But right now, we see that her womb is being closed. So that's how we end chapter 30. It's a very interesting um, passage because we see um, this movement towards people, this movement towards children. And in the past, we have seen a husband and a wife bearing one son, a husband and a wife bearing two sons. Now we're seeing a husband and a wife and some extra people we're going to talk about in a minute uh, bearing 12 sons and one daughter. So we see this as a, a really big push towards families that families that are going to end up being nations are going to end up being the sons of Jacob the sons of Israel and through these people the covenant is going to continue and we're going to end up um, at the end of these people they're going to end up in captivity as we know but these are the people that God is going to continue the covenant with when they get to Mount Sinai so start thinking about how these people are going to act how these people are going to be named and what kind of prophecies do you see coming from these people in just the simple naming of them and how their names are going to be important to um, their actual redemption? So now we're moving forward. We're going to hit chapter 30 and we're going to inter be introduced to some additional people here. But what I want you to kind of really start thinking of is there is themes and concepts, okay? There's going to be these things and concepts that are going to come through in this next chapter or two. So verses one to eight, Rachel saw that her, that she was bearing no children. And so what happens? Envy starts in. She's getting angry. Envy, these spirits that are not of God start coming into her spirit. It's okay to be angry. It's okay to even be jealous. It's okay to do these things. But you can't let the spirits motivate you. And here is where we have a problem. She envies her sister to the point she is making declarations, give me children or I will die to her husband. So she is angry that she is not bearing children. She doesn't understand. I am the one who's loved. Why am I not the one bearing children? So Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel. He says, am I in the place of God? he's the one that's withheld the fruit of your womb not me and she says here's my servant bill hog go into her that she may give birth on my behalf and that i even may have children through her so she gave him her servant bill Hog as a wife jacob goes into her and bill Hog conceives and bears jacob a son jacob um obviously is <laughs> the man right so we see um no praying we see no consulting with God we just see hey here's a solution take her and we have consequences um, the consequences are going to be felt throughout the, the naming of these children as well because we see Dan is going to be named judge Rachel says God has judged me and has also heard my voice and given me a son so if God has judged her then she's thinking this is a a good fruit or a bad fruit of that judgment of God. Um, it's interesting how she's realizing God has judged her for her behavior, but yet he blesses her with a son. Uh, she calls him name, his name Dan, and Rachel's servant conceives again and bears him a second son. And then Rachel says, with a mighty wrestling, I have wrestled with my sister and I have prevailed. So she is operating in the physical at this point. She's seeing that I am setting up circumstances so I can have children. I'm not waiting on God. I'm taking the lead. So she calls his name Naphtali. And so with this, this spirit that is opposite of what God is, is wanting for us, wanting for them, 
circumstances and things happen. We see her naming her children as a reflection of her sadness and not being able to bear children. So their names are reflecting the emotions of Rachel. Now we have tit for tat, right? When Leah sees that she has stopped bearing children, she gives her servant Zilpah to Jacob as a wife. Leah's servant Zilpah bears Jacob a son and Leah says, good fortune has come. So she calls his name Gad. Happens a second time. And now we have um, Asher, which means um, happy. Happy am I for the women have called me happy. So it's very interesting that, that Leah is doing exactly what Rachel is doing. Okay, I can't have children, so you can take this person and we can, we can move God along in the way we think it should be moved. But no one, again, is stopping and praying about, hey, what is God doing here? What is God asking us to do? Is he asking us to be faithful? Do you think he's asking us to, to pause and, and see what he has for us? I do believe Jacob would have had 12 children. But if they had just waited, then we would not have the chaos that we're going to have later in, in these stories. Last part of um, 14 to 24, this is our, going to be our last portion today. In the days of the wheat harvest, Reuben went and he found mandrakes in the field. He brought them to his mother. And then Leah said, Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. And she said to him, is it a small matter that you have taken away my husband?" Would you also take away my son's mandrakes? And Rachel said, then he may lie with you tonight in exchange for your son's mandrakes. So when Jacob comes in from the field in the evening, Leah goes out to meet him and says, you must come in to me for I have hired you with my son's mandrakes. So he lays with her that night. Poor Jacob, right? He, he's got such a handle on his hands because he's got two women that are fighting literally physically and spiritually they're trying to outdo them with children outdo them with wives and so now he is it seems like there had been an order to this reproduction cycle and it wasn't really um Leah's time but it was Rachel's time but they switched because of the mandrake issue but God listens to Leah and she bears another son so this is the fifth son and Leah says God has given me my wages I gave my servant to my husband, so she names him Issachar. Leah conceives again. So now Leah's having a baby. She's got Issachar now. She's having another one. And now we're going to call this one Zebulun. God has endowed me with a good endowment. Now my husband will honor me because I have borne him six sons. She's still hoping that he is going to love and respect her because of products that she's giving him, which are sons. Afterwards, she, bore, she bears a daughter named Dinah. Dinah is going to be the 13th child. Um, there's going to be 12 sons and one daughter. And then God remembered Leah. God hadn't forgot about Leah. Remember when we say the word remember, it doesn't mean that God has forgotten her. It means God has, has um, remembered her in the way of now it's time to continue what I had already started in you, or I'm, I'm now ready to continue this part of the covenant because now she's going to have a child that's going to change everything. She conceives and bears a son and she says, God has taken away my reproach. She calls his name Joseph. May the son add to me another son. So we're going to close here because we're going to end up um, with some more scriptures. Um, next week, we'll, we'll have some time together. But I want you to ponder on these names of these sons. We have one more son that has not been born yet. He's going to be born on the way um, as they travel. And that's going to be Benjamin. Or right now we have 11 sons and one daughter. And so start thinking about who these people are, what their names mean, how their names are prophetic and how their names are going to be important as they move in and out of this land and into the land of Egypt. But God has given all of these children for a purpose some of them are going to be good some of them are going to be bad so but all of them are going to be important to the continuation of the covenant so i want y'all to start thinking about covenant and what that actually means so until next time we will pick up doing 
the last part of 30 and we'll hit 31, 32, and 33 next time. See y'all then. Bye.